Good morning. God works in mysterious ways. This morning, while I was doing my reading, <laughs> was in Colossians 1, 17 through 19. <laughs> That's what I have to read this morning. So, <laughs> praise God. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Amen. Can you hear me? Okay. We'll make sure it's high enough that you can hear me because my voice isn't that great. <coughs> okay, because I'm not going to be yelling up here. I might get excited. I don't know. I'm kind of tired, but it's good to be back. <coughs> I have congestion from all of the mold spores and everything else that you face going all across this country and then coming back to this precious land that we live in here but anyway i'm fine don't worry i don't have covid or anything i don't think so bow your heads with me in prayer father in heaven we thank you and praise you for you are such an awesome god worthy of all of our praise glory and honor lord and we fail to give it to you so much lord we do thank you so much to, to see the blessing of trinity walking around what an answer to prayer father Lord, we don't know how many times that you're there to protect us, that your angels are there, not only as messengers for us, but to protect and guide us, and not that, but that we have the Holy Spirit, your Spirit, living with us, telling our spirit how to worship you, Lord, and to teach us your ways, to write your words on our heart, to live like Jesus in this world, and help us to not take that for granted, but to love like Jesus, to live like Jesus until we meet him face to face. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <clears throat> so I'm going to use you as an example at the end again, Merle, too. Okay? Because God does work in mysterious ways, and you'll understand that when I say it. So you should have read while I was gone. You had a lot of reading, but it's really not a lot of reading because it's five minutes a day, five days a week. Are you reading it? I went to church um, with my mom, and they had a reading plan, but it wasn't discussed at all in, in the church. I don't know how they do it or anything, but the reason that I reinforce is to get you where you'll read what we're talking about, where we're on the same page, where we're fellowshipping together, we're studying together, and then when we go over it in church, maybe you'll get some more information, you'll, you'll think of something else, because every time you read God's Word, it is alive, and it pops out at you, and it penetrates your heart and your soul. So you should have read Acts, <clears throat> Acts 17 through 20, and you read about Paul's second missionary journey and his third missionary journey, and you notice he visited in both of those a city named Philippi, which we then read the letter um, to the Philippian church. This is a letter that Paul writes not as an, an, a corrective letter, but he writes this letter because he's in prison and he is thanking them for their hospitality, for their encouragement. They are encouraging him while he's in prison. They're living like Christ in this world. And then we write, <clears throat> read the letter to the, Colossians, to the church at Colossae. It's written around the same time. Paul is in prison when he writes this, and this is written to a church that he's never visited. And this letter is meant to be shared with other churches, like the church at La Laodicea. And then you finish up your reading with Acts 21 to 23, where you see the process of Paul going from a free man who is suffering and persecuted and the Holy Spirit driving him and persecution driving him to these different areas where the gospel is being spread to the ends of the earth. You see him going to the point of from being free to preach the gospel to preaching the gospel in chains. And then next week you will finish reading um, the book of Acts. As you get to the end of Acts, you'll notice that it just kind of doesn't really end. It's just a continuation. Because we are the church living today just as it started so many years ago. 
So I want you to think about that and say, are you living like the church that you're reading about in Acts and these other letters? And notice the constant bombardment from the outside world of false doctrines, of everything else that will strip you of living a life of worth for your King, Jesus. Don't get distracted. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Throw anything away that would hinder you and the sins that so easily entangle you. Acts is a story of the church, and the story of the church is still being written today until Jesus Christ returns, and it includes you and I. Ecclesia is the Greek word used for church. You'll find it 118 times in the New Testament, but you'll only find it two times in the Gospels. Jesus says, I will build my church, when he's talking to Peter, when Peter declares that he is the, um, the Son of God, the Messiah. And right after that, you'll read that Jesus says that if you don't deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after him, you can't be a, a part of the kingdom of God. You'll also read about it in Matthew 18, 17, when Jesus talks about disciplining the church. That's the only two times Jesus uses it. The other 116 times you'll have to get from the other New Testament letters to find out what the church really is. Because it's not a building. It's not uh, a establishment. It is the people of God living like Christ in this world. It is the body of Christ. And what good is a body without a head? It can't function. It dies, period. It has to have the head transmitting the blood, the nerves, everything else. It tells the body what to do. And then the body functions the best when it is obedient to the head and all the members are working together so that the brain can tell the body, the head can tell the body what to do, and that can be done. And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or seasons or anything else, but it's for you to be my witnesses in this world to live a different life in this world so that others will see Christ in you. Here's the first times that the word Ecclesia is used after the Gospels. In Acts 2.47, <clears throat> Praising God, enjoying the favor of the people, and the Lord added to their number, that means church, that's Ecclesia, daily those who were being saved. In Acts 5.11, after the events with Ananias and Sapphira, you're familiar with them, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. So it can't be a building. It's not just an establishment. It's a people. In Acts 3, after the stoning of Stephen, which drove Philip to spread the gospel to Samaria, it says, But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. And you'll notice that it's a people group again, and it's from house to house because they're meeting in houses together, constantly fellowshipping, constantly learning about the scriptures so that they can live a life of worth, so that they can be bound together to comfort one another, to share their spiritual gifts, to be a kingdom-oriented people. Now, in Acts 11:26, and when he found him, that's Barnabas finding Saul, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Acts 19.32, which you read during this time period when I was gone, after the riot, or during the riot at Ephesus, it says, The assembly, that's the same word, ecclesia, was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they, why they were there. In Acts 20.28, 20, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of, the Holy, of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. So you are a people bought with the blood of Jesus Christ to do something, to spread the gospel message and to live like Christ in this world. Both of them have to be present. That's why James was one of the first ones that wrote a letter, and he wrote a letter to the church and said, if you don't have works, I don't believe your faith. It's dead. A body without a head is dead. It's obvious that Jesus purchased a people for his own. The holy standards that you read in the Old Testament apply here, and we have the power and ability to do it now because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. As Peter writes, we are a holy priesthood building a kingdom. That's what the church is. So I went to church while I was gone one time. 
I went with my mom. So I was gone two Sundays. I haven't seen um, Waltz or Kim's yet, but I will enjoy seeing them. And I went to this fabulous building. They had the countdown on the big screens up on the wall, counting down the time. So it was exactly, I don't know what would have happened if you weren't there. And they made mistakes in music and everything else too. It wasn't perfection. I don't know why we try to worry about perfection. We need to worship God with our hearts. Who cares what it looks like? Who cares if I look like a fool for Jesus? <laughs> so be it, right? And <clears throat> there was a, the, the church, I don't want to say things that's degrading because that's not my purpose at all. The church is going through things that the church is going through. They, they don't have a pastor now for whatever reason. There was a, a man that came in that's got all of his credentials and everything. And he gave a great speech I'll put it that way but he didn't teach he didn't shepherd he didn't oversee there's a big difference they have their reading schedule but I didn't learn anything at all I was disconnected and I say that not to tear down but to thank you for this church I long to come back to this church to be connected with the body of Christ to know that we can reach out to those that are in need and comfort because the Holy Spirit comforts us. That we can go to each other and lift each other up. We can cry, we can laugh, we can sing together. And we can hold each other accountable for the lives that we live. One of the t most terrible things for especially a shepherd, a pastor, is reading that verse that says, On that day <clears throat> there will be many that cry out, Lord, Lord. And Jesus says, Depart from me, I do not know you. Those are people that look like they're going to heaven. They've even cast out demons in Jesus' name, but they do not know Him. They do not have a relationship with Him. I hope and pray, and I will do everything that I can to oversee this church, to know that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ and that you don't live a life of waste, but you live a life of worth. He preached on 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times having all that you need you will abound at every good work and when I saw that verse I was like hey, there's that good work thing again what we're talking about things we're doing and every time I know it looks like I'm trying to push you towards doing good works well of course I am because that's what the gospel is all about it's about a changed life a people that have pulled themselves out from the way of the world and live in such a way even when they're persecuted, even when they're slapped, they turn the other cheek. When they're <clears throat> asked to be, give their coat to somebody, they give them their shirt off their back also. Yet we live such a different life and we praise God and thank Him for His blessings day after day after day that they see that in us and they want to know more about it. And God is able to bless us. The King James Version says, make all grace. And He had the little bulletin points and everything and and the three points are the activity of God's grace, the availability of God's grace, and the abundance of God's gift of grace. When we were done, Mom said, how did you like the sermon? I said, it was well presented. I said, let me ask you a question. What is grace? Not what you think, it, from what the shepherd taught you. What is grace? No idea. And I was able to talk to some other people too. Why did God give you grace? If I give you something, I give it for a purpose for you to use it for whatever that is. And if I'm the king of all kings and lord of all lords and I give you something, you should know what you're supposed to do with it. Grace is the breath we breathe, the, the ability that we have that we see a child walking around like nothing happened. That, that we survive cancer or we don't. That we had all the life that we lived with the loved ones before that. That we get on our knees and we pray and we thank God for His blessings because we deserve an eternity apart from Him in a place called hell. But He is so gracious that He blesses us. He is merciful for us. He gives us what we don't deserve. Instead, He gives us the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I give an example. We know that we're, we're sinners. I give an example of getting caught and getting a ticket no I didn't get one while I was gone I'm surprised Sherry didn't know oh the more she drives and the more there's people that cut her off and stuff I'm like and she's talking about 
what they're doing. I'm like, you're doing the same thing. <laughs> and I look, I'm like, how fast are you going? Well, I got to get, get in front of this guy. Why? <laughs> but when you get caught, you know you did wrong. Period. You did wrong. All have sinned, and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wow! <clears throat> but if that law officer stopped you and said, hey, do you know you're speeding? And you admit to him. You don't say, oh, what's that? i got bigger tires or my speedometer. No. You say, yeah, I was speeding. I'm guilty. Then you deserve whatever the punishment is. And if that officer said, I'm not going to give you a ticket, huh, that's a blessing, that's grace. But then if he said, guess what? I'm going to do this for you because I love you so much. <laughs> I'm going to give you, I'm going to pardon your sin. I'm going to give you the keys to my mansion over there on the hilltop. And here's a car that you can drive to it. And oh yeah, my son paid for this lot, car with his life. I mean, that's grace. We deserve punishment for our sins. But instead, we're given grace. Why? So that we can be gracious and tell others about Jesus Christ. And if you can't have the works again, they're not going to listen to your preaching. It's going to be void. <clears throat> Mom didn't ask me any more questions about the sermon after that. But it did, did give an opportunity that I was able to talk to my dad, I talked to my mom, talk to, to um, my dad's girlfriend, which he calls his wife when he's out here, to y'all guys, and everything. They've been together a long time. Um, and we were able to talk about that, and we were able to teach and study. And I think Pat said she'd even call me some when she had some questions because there were so many things that she had no idea because she hasn't been taught it in church. And it breaks my heart. So she hears these things and she thinks they're in the Bible and I don't know if she doesn't read enough, I don't, but that's not my point. A body needs a head to live and it has to have nourishment to live or it dies even if it has a head. Are you feeding on God's Word? Are you praying to Him? Are you thanking Him? Are you counting your blessings, naming them one by one? Is this the kind of life that you're living in? If it is, Others will see it. And when given the opportunity, you tell them about Jesus Christ. You don't try to force it down your throat. You wait till they're receptive and they ask you and then you just tell them and you can't stop because the Holy Spirit gives you the words to say that even when you're being stoned to death, you tell them about Jesus. I mean, that's what we've read about. <clears throat> I am so thankful for this church and for everyone here that makes up the body of Christ. To remind you about 1 Corinthians, I'm going to give you a little bit of an example there because he didn't really say what this was about leading up to this verse. You're familiar that with the Corinth church. Paul has to write several letters to them, probably. We know at least three, maybe four. We only have two of them, though. And they're because of problems in the church because they didn't want to give up the world, but they wanted to have Jesus and the world, and you can't do that. In chapter 1, God says that, that they were comforted so that they can give comfort. In chapter 2, this is 2 Corinthians, um, Paul tells them to forgive others and that he is their shepherd and because he is suffering for the gospel, that proves that he is their shepherd. In chapter 3, he tells them that they are freed to preach and live this new covenant, something that the old covenant and the law could not do. In chapter 4, he says the truth is that these momentary things that we suffer, these eternal rewards far outweigh whatever we suffer here on earth. In chapter 5, he says that we are living for the eternal, not for what's here now, that we are actually ambassadors spreading the message of reconciliation, that we are Christ's ambassadors. In chapter 6, he tells us about suffering and warning them not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Ta-da! There's a verse that's way misinterpreted. Read your scriptures. It has nothing to do with marriage. It's talking about a believer unequally yoked together with an unbeliever because we should be unyoked for them. We're not working for the master of this world anymore. We're working for King Jesus. 
We all know that we're servants. We're pulling a load. We have an accountab accountability to someone, and we're serving one master or the other. And Paul says, be unyoked with them. Instead, take on Jesus' yoke. You think it's hard, but it is not. It is soft. It is easy. It is good for you. <clears throat> In chapter 7, the church has repented, um, and Paul is overjoyed. In chapter 8, there is a collection being taken up for other churches. And I'll read you starting in verse 6. So we urged Titus just as he had earlier made as he had earlier made a beginning to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. We're leading up to that 2 Corinthians 9:8 verse. This act of grace is giving, and in this case it's material giving. But since you excel in everything, verse 7, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in love we have kindled in you. If you remember, the Corinthian church wanted all the better gifts, and, and Paul told them to, to strive for prophecy, to understand scriptures, not tongues. And he said the greatest gift of all is love. Without love, you're just a noisy whatever. Okay? A, a gong symbol. You know what I'm saying. <clears throat> In complete earnestness in love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Your example is Jesus Christ. Christ, no other example. Yes, imitate Paul. Yes, imitate a good leader. As long as they're imitating Christ, you see what they're doing. But Jesus Christ is your example. He is your head. He is the one that as you yield to the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth to be like Him. And then in chapter 9, and we're leading up to that verse, remember this, this is verse 6, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Now the verse can, can be taken way out of context. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly to give you more grace, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. He gives you grace so that you can do good in this world, not build up kingdoms for yourself, building on sands, but building up eternal kingdoms, not living for your desires and your needs, but thinking of others more than you think of yourselves. Verse 9, as it, is, as, it is, as it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Permanent, eternal rewards. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and it will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have, pr have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ, works in action of what you prof profess, and for the generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. <clears throat> and in their prayers for their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to the God for this in indescribable gift. Now there's teaching you what grace is and what you're supposed to do with it. This breath that I just took, this being here in this church to freely preach with you, to enjoy your fellowship with one another, to have God's Word written where I don't have to hide it somewhere and be persecuted for having it, that I can get it on a phone or a tablet, I can get um, commentaries, everything else, I can go turn on the TV and watch sermons. I have God's message all the time, so how much am I feeding myself? so that I can live like Christ. I know how much I physically eat each day, and I know what happens when I don't eat, and how long I can survive potentially without eating. My body breaks down, it gets sick. Fill yourself with God's Word. It is more important than the bread, meat that you can eat physically. <clears throat> In Acts 20, 28, <clears throat> Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock 
of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds. That means to feed, to tend, to keep, to furnish green pasture and provide still waters <clears throat> so that he can be nourished and grow like the great shepherd. Are you thinking of Psalms 23 as I say that? To serve the body, to supply the needs of the soul, to be shepherds of the church, the ecclesia of God, which he bought with his own blood. You have been purchased while you were still Christ's enemies to be his followers, to be his believers. And if you don't deny yourself and take up your cross, then you can't follow after him. You might be saved, but you'll live a life that is worthless rather than a life of worth. And who doesn't want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant? Who doesn't want to hear, hey, hey, you remember when you came and talked to me about Jesus? I'm here today as a result. And you've got to feed and you've got to nourish and you've got to live step by step with the Spirit and listen to Jesus as the head. <clears throat> Paul goes on in 2 Corinthians to tell them that God's grace is sufficient. You may remember because he says three times he prayed to take this thorn in the flesh from him. And we don't even know what that thorn in the flesh is. You've probably been taught it was probably his eyesight. But go back and read that scripture. That scripture says that Satan is doing this thorn in the flesh to him. If it was his eyesight, that would be a problem with the fact that he got blinded on the road and God didn't fully restore his height, sight, but God restored his sight. The scales fell off and he could see clearly. So I don't think that's it, but I'll tell you when it's something I think, I say, I think. I don't know what it is. Maybe it was epileptic seizures. Maybe it was whatever. But Satan gave him a thorn in the flesh to stop his ministry, and Paul prayed that to, to God to take it away. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. <clears throat> As we close out 2 Corinthians, Paul warns in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So you should have read the, the letter to, Phil, to the church in Philippi and the church in Colossae. You should have got so much rich meat out of that. You should have seen so much as Christ being supreme, being more important than anything else. And then that takes me back to Hebrews. That takes me to, to, to Ephesians, everywhere else. <clears throat> and Paul in Philippians says that he thanks God in Philippians 1 verse 3 every time he remembers them this church that he's established, that he's a part of, because he knows they're praying for them, and he knows that they're sending out their gifts for them. In all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. You don't have to worry. It is, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or, def or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me, whether you're in prison or you're freed. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. And how can you do that unless you're studying together? So that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. So if we are the body with Christ the head, what does our body look like? It's an examination question, and I told you Paul closed out the letter to Corinthians there, and he said, examine yourself well to know if Christ really does dwell in you. Because if God gave His one and only Son to save you from an eternity apart from Him, from everything that is good, you think that you've got things wrong in this world and, you, and, you, and poor, poor, pitiful me and everything else, if God took His grace away from you, it would be like hell. And He hasn't done that. Instead, He's given you His one and only Son to save you so that you can have all of His grace and experience it for all eternity. In Philippians chapter 2, you may have noticed when you read that the, there's a section that's indented or whatever you want to say. It's a song or a hymn. 
We don't know if that song or hymn is something that Paul wrote then or if it was something that the early church had at that time. It doesn't follow Paul's writing if you look at it. It's a little differently. So that leads me to think, me again, that it's something that the church knew and sang, and Paul told them about this hymn again to remind them what they have in Christ Jesus. And it goes this way, second, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, "...in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus." who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So I ask you again, how is the body living compared to the head, which is Jesus? Do we recognize this? Do we live this way? After the song, Paul goes on to write, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, verse 12, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. That's why we have to stand out and look different. Then you will shine among them like stars in the skies as you wholly fir hold firmly to the words of life. There's much more meat in the gospel or in the letter to the church at Philippi, but if I kept on, I'd be here for a long, long time and we wouldn't have a board meeting and such. Okay? But I do want to mention a little to you about Colossians, and I hope that you read it. In Colossians chapter 1, remember this is a church that Paul's never even been to and he wouldn't have the opportunity to write this letter except that he was imprisoned. <clears throat> and he starts this way in verse 3, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all of God's people. And love is shown by how you do things with it, not just by saying I love you, it's by what you do. <clears throat> the faith and love that sprang, sprang from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world because of how you live and love, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. Grace. And my mom couldn't say what grace was or why you were giving it. Do you get it? God is gracious, the, bre the breath of air you breathe, plus everything else, so that you can spread the gospel message and be good to others. Not think of your own self, not to build up kingdoms here on earth for your own self, but to think of others as Christ thought of you. Even while you were enemy, He looked for, for the joy of going to the cross so that He could pardon you and buy you back into fellowship with God. And if you notice in verse 7, you learned it from Epaphras, not from Paul, not from one of the twelve. Who? Epaphras. He, he, he's in a couple more verses, but who? From Merle, from Alan, from whoever. From Chuck. From whoever. Because we love and live like Jesus in this world. And we have to know what God's word is to be able to live it. You have to take this in, digest it, eat it. <clears throat> Paul is also writing this letter because there is false gospels going on in the church. And he says clearly in the, in the passage that Merle read earlier, verse 18 of, of Colossians 1, and he is the head of the body, the church. The firstborn, uh, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he, may, he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood. 
Verse 21, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior, but now He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in His sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become servant. Then he says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, that you are made alive with Christ. If Christ is your head, He's what tells my body what to do. I need to have a nourished, functioning body all joined together with every part doing its part, and I need to listen to the head so that I can live like Jesus in this world. And Jesus clearly gave His body, gave His life to save others. And He said to you, no greater love than a man hath than to lay down his life for his friends. If you believe in Jesus, how can you still live for yourself? How can you continue to say, not your will, God, but my will? What does the body of Christ look like today? Is it being nourished? I promise to shepherd you, to give you my heart, my soul, as, as Christ shepherds me. Will you join me in that? And will we function together as a body? And will we live for Christ and long for the day that He returns? 2 Corinthians 6, as God's co-workers... Paul's writing this to a church that he didn't establish. It's a church that he's never visited. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. It's not for tomorrow. If you don't know Jesus Christ, come to Him today. Be saved today. But if you're not living as He is King of your life, then get rid of all the other baggage, all the sins today, and live for Him. It doesn't matter what kingdoms you build here on sand. You won't carry them into eternity. But the relationships you have, the love that you have, and the gospel message that you share very well may build treasures in heaven. We worry too much about the physical things, and we don't take enough faith to, work, to say, God, give me daily bread so that I can do your will. We deny some of the urgings of the Holy Spirit. If you, if you read that scripture, you know that the believer said, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. And he was already prophesied that he would be bound and taken to, to Jerusalem. And the believers said, don't do it. And then finally they said, well, God's will be done. <laughs> yeah, of course. Why would we try to fight against it? We don't know the outcome. In every trial and tribulation, every good time, every bad time, God's grace is shining upon us so that He can bring about His will and bring about the reconciliation of man to God until Jesus Christ returns. And you're privileged to be a part of that. Okay, here's a test. <clears throat> I told you I'm going to use you as an example because the Bible does not say God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> God, the Bible does not say this too shall pass. The Bible not, does not say God helps those who help themselves. Those are things in Christian doxology of the church, and, or doctor, not doxology, that we hear all the time, and I'm not condemning them. But they're not in the Bible. Know what's in the Bible. Read the Bible so you know that it's not. So here comes a test. How many wise men visited Jesus? You can find it in Matthew chapter 2 if you don't know. Come on, give me an answer. Maybe. We don't know. We know there were at least three gifts given. We have no idea how many wise men or magi. That's not a big thing of doctrine, nothing else. But know what you read. Study to be an approved workman. True or false? Jesus was born in a manger in a stable. Why? Okay. Was he laid in a manger in a stable? We don't know. We know he was laid in a manger, which is a feeding trough. 
many uh, houses, it says there was no room for them in the inn, which means no room in the house, not an inn like we have, Motel 6. Um, it could have been in the backyard of the people that there were, the family was there. We don't know where it was at. We know he was laid in a manger. Whether there was a roof over his head or not, we don't know. We know there were animals, okay? The Antichrist is talked about in Revelation, true or false? False. Where is the Antichrist mentioned? What? Mm -mm. This should be telling you need to feed more. 1 John 2.18, 1 John 2.22, 1 John 4.3, and 2 John 1.7. Is the Antichrist a single person? All of those verses say the Antichrist is here now. If anything, anyone is Antichrist, they are an Antichrist. We don't know if there'll be one particular person or not, or if it's governments or whatever, but John uses the word, and he uses it to describe anybody who doesn't live like Christ. Satan's name is Lucifer. You ought to learn by now. I'm giving you kind of trick questions, but... Oh, bright and morning star is what it means, and it's the, the word is Lucifer, shining, the shining one or shining star. But you'll find it in Isaiah 14, and Isaiah is writing about the king of Babylon, not writing about Satan. It might be imagery of Satan, might not be, but we don't know that Lucifer is the name of the devil. Okay, We do know he is that serpent of old from Revelation. <clears throat> Noah took two of every kind of animal on the ark. True or false? Genesis chapter 6. Okay, what's tr truth? Seven of birds and cloved hoof that chew their cud. Did you know that? Okay, so what does that mean? He took sheep and goats. What else? Cattle. What else? Deer, moose, antelope, elk, giraffes. Took seven giraffes. See, I learned that from the ark experience. Because they're, they're split-toed hooves and they chew their cud. You know, that's very important if you're of Jewish background because you've separated yourself and you chew over God's Word and you redigest it and chew it so you know right from wrong and you live God's Word, you hear and obey and you look for shalom and peace that passes all understanding that can only come to you through Jesus Christ. Now, I know I gave you some examples that kind of mess with you. But read and study God's Word. Don't just take a good sermon and clap and say amen and not get any, th any meat out of it. Don't just come and listen to just a sermon. Study God's Word. i got no problem with you coming up to me and saying, you know, you talked about this here. Let's talk about that. I, I know you're listening then. <laughs> And I told you that those things aren't in the Bible like God helps those who help themselves. This too shall pass. God works in mysterious ways. I got one more question for you. And then a little scripture for, for us to read. In heaven, the streets are paved with gold. True or false? Good job! Verla, it says the street, the main street of heaven is paved, is paved with gold. All right, what does it say, though? It also says the city is of gold, shining like glass. Why is that? Because it has been refined, made pure, perfectly pure. The whole city and the main street going in and the rivers of life flowing, the, tr the, the uh, tree of life on each side. It's the Garden of Eden again, but with everything pure. It's not the streets, it's the street. I know that's a technicality. Here's what Revelation 21 going into 22 says. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with a rod and found out it to be 1,200 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long, so a cube. The angel measured the wall using a human measurement 
and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city wall were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third gate agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were pearls, and each gate made a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not t need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God <coughs> gives it light, and the lamp, lamb, it, lamb is its lamp. Sorry, The nations will walk by its light, and the king of the earth will bring their splendor into it. And on no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will enter it, nor will anyone who does, not, who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nature, nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. So my question for you is, if you're the body of Christ, are you being fed? First of all, are you connected? Do you have a head? Are you connected to Jesus? Do you have a right relationship with Him? And then if you do, is the Holy Spirit revealing all truth, guiding in, your, in all truth, comforting you, teaching you? Are you walking in step with the Holy Spirit? Are there fruits of it because you're reading God's Word, you're praying, you're fellowshipping with one another? Is the head attached to the body and is it living like Jesus in this world? Because you're going through a process of refinement and heaven is worth Anything on this earth that is light and momentary. Your faith is as precious. Work it out with fear and trembling. Live a life that glorifies God and don't worry about everything else. Love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength and love others as much as you love yourself. Are we doing that? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for your abundant bountiful, wonderful, merciful grace upon grace upon grace. That we not only can be saved, but we can be part of this process of bringing the gospel message of living like Christ in this world. Oh God, we thank you and praise you for the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And we thank you that we come to you by faith, not by works of righteousness. But that you also equip us with every grace, every thing that we need for, for works of righteousness, that we may bring glory and honor to you and bring about reconciliation to mankind. Father, give us daily bread. Lord, your will be done. Help us to walk your, in your way, Lord, no matter what the circumstances are. Lord, may we trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. And Lord, may we show others the way home. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. three. 